essence of this is how can we get more connected so and more connected locally and then more connected in the bioregion, which is what Joel will talk about. So we can start, how I see it is we're, we're seeing so much destruction and so much pain and so much suffering. What can we do to support life and be part of that aspect of what's happening? Because there is also the potential for something to rise and grow in this time. And we can't just give in to the, I don't want to give in <laughs> to the, just the despair of it's all awful. And we can together grow and build life and a blessing. So that's what motivated me to step into pulling this thing together. And uh, I've been tracking Joe uh, for years through your, you know, I know you with occasional visits, but your story that you've shared, and Vicki's going to introduce you officially, but the story you share on Facebook has really touched me. And I've witnessed your journey through many, many phases of coming to terms with what's happening on the planet. And the enlivenment and the, the regeneration movement gives me hope. So um, that's why we're here, and I think that's why people wanted to come. Um, so <sighs> the, the flow of the evening is um, I'm going to do a little quiet music so we can just sit for a few minutes, a little song bath, and um, an opening. And then Joe will have like a 45 minute talk to um, share with us, and then we'll have some community conversation. And I would like us to move into witnessing how many amazing things are actually going.
How are you right now? Just let out a breath. Ah. 
like to offer a land acknowledgement, and it's a land acknowledgement in process and learning and in relationship with the peoples who still reside here. Um, I shared the one that I had um, with some tribal members on the island, and I'm going to share what they said in response. So, we reside on the ancestral homelands of the Coast Salish peoples of <coughs> Tulalip, Sinomish, Snohomish, Stiligwamish, and Suquamish, who have lived in the Salish Sea Basin since time immemorial. My home is on Whippy Island, or our home is on Whippy Island, originally known as Chakolchi in Lushuthi, a language of the region. And I, I asked for feedback on this as when I had was offered some contact with the tribal people who live here now. And I'm just going to read what she said because it's complex. <clears throat> Good morning. Um, Becky Porter, my cousin, forwarded your email to me. While I haven't had a chance to look at your event, I did read your land acknowledgement. The first tribe you acknowledge is not a tribe, but a reservation. That's the Tulala, is a reservation. And that's over the waters um, looking sort of to the east for us, is that? Um, they are the Tulalip Confederate tribes, which means there are many tribes living under that umbrella, including some of our relatives, the Suhoks or Snohomish tribe. That doesn't mean those of us who did not go to the reservation aren't Snohomish. We have never given up our heritage nor our name. There has never been a Tulalip tribe. Our family has lived here in an unbroken line since before there were settlers. There is a lot of live history here on the island. We are still here. Thank you. So Vicki is going to introduce Joe. I've been asked to introduce Joe, but I, I don't know about you. I'm just so spacey. <laughs> <laughs> I met Joe first in 2011 at a winter gathering. So that's another stream that has been weaving us together for many years. And I look at this map and I think about when I, I joined those streams in 1990 when we started Sustainable Seattle. And at that time, Lansing Scott called this the Ish River region. You look at it, and it's the Snohomish, Skykomish, Stiligwamish. This is our, I started learning at that time to see this as home and to have the feeling and privilege to be part of this landscape. Um, and just I want to remind us that there are many streams that have brought us here tonight over many, many years. I'm a newcomer on this landscape. So many of us have tried this weave, you know, have been making this weave, and it weaves in and out, and thank God Joe's here to weave us again. Thank you so much, Joe. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ricky. Thank, thank you, Governor, for all of your wonderful hosting and organizing. Hello, everyone. My name's Joe Brewer. I know several of you. And I want to tell you first that um, for me, it's a great honor to be here because of my first invitation to Whidbey Island, which was in January of 2011. So really not that long ago. But I want to specifically honor Rick and Grassi for inviting me. It has changed my life. <laughs> because I met Rick a few weeks before the winter gathering in 2011 at the Whidbey Institute. And he was learning about this crazy work I was doing, applying cognitive science to political behavior to try to create different political outcomes. And he said, we need this. And so 
I'm going to put you at the very front at the opening keynote to start the whole thing. And then I was bound to have many, many friends on Whidbey Island. And so I want to just honor you, Rick. It's, it means so much to me. I also want to start by saying that the entire time that I lived in Seattle, between 2008 and 2017, I carried a specific burden, a specific grief, which was that I'd fallen in love. My first time in Cascadia was a bike tour down the Oregon coast, and then I moved to Eugene. And then later, I moved to Seattle. And my burden was that I fell instantly in love with this place. I grew up in Missouri in another bioregion called the Ozarks. But I never really felt I belonged there. And the first time I felt I belonged was here. And yet, I couldn't bring my gifts. I kept trying in different ways. But I was called all over the world giving talks and workshops and failing and succeeding. And it was a really dramatic time. And when I left, because I now live in Colombia in South America, I felt this pain that I was not able to bring my gifts. Because for whatever reason, this place wasn't ready to receive them. And so I learned by living in Barichara, Colombia, which I'll talk a little bit about tonight, what it means for land to receive you. Because I learned what it was like to bury part of my heart in the land while growing forest. And for whatever reason, the cosmic humor of Gaia or Pachamama or the Great Mother, I'm able to bring my gifts to you now. And it's such an honor. It's such an honor to be here. Now, I have a talk that I've prepared that will claim some authority or some legitimacy, as if I have something to say. And I want to offer you my only credential. I do this in a lot of my talks. I only have one credential. It's not my degrees. It's not the work that I've done. It's not the accomplishments I've had that I've created in the world. It's none of those things. It's that knowing what is happening to the state of our planet with eyes wide open, I chose to have a child. And I'm a father. And my daughter is almost seven years old. And so my claim to any legitimacy is that I chose to believe in the future of humanity when I was very afraid of extinction. And I put skin in the game, and it's wrapped around the body of my daughter. That is my claim to anything that is worth listening to. What I want to talk to you about tonight is what happened for me when I came to acceptance about the state of the world. You know when you're clinging so tight you don't have the energy to reach for what you might want. And only by coming to a place of acceptance about the state of the world, which I was really doing in like 2015, 2016. My daughter was born in 2017, all part of the same process. As I was coming to realize that I could give love even if there was no hope. Or as a dear friend of mine would say, a dear friend to many of you, our recently lost Michael Dowd, is that what we must get beyond doom. We must live in a post-doom world, a world where hope is not actually relevant to our actions. All that matters is that our love is true. Because if our love is true, the outcome doesn't really matter in the same way. But it still matters. And nothing can take it away. So I come to you with that sensibility tonight. And I'm feeling very moved to be here with you. Because I want to talk to you about how to regenerate Cascadia. I want to talk to you about what we can do to make this work in the midst of the most difficult time that humanity has ever had to deal with. Now, I've studied the history of human evolution. And I know that there are at least two occasions, one about 80,000 years ago, another about 150,000 years ago, where our ancestors almost drove our species to extinction. One of those times, we got down to about 10,000 individual human beings. We almost went extinct. And so I know that it is possible to have this outcome that I fear. 
but my fear doesn't stop me anymore. Because what I want to talk to you about is the only pathway that I could find that made sense after dispelling many false promises. Some of you may know that back in 2011, 2012, I did this activity called Seattle Innovators about making Seattle a carbon neutral city. I'm not sure that cities can ever be sustainable, even though I love what sustainable Seattle has done. And I'm OK with that now. Not in the sense that I endorse it, but in the sense that I know what must be done either way. And so what I want to talk to you about is a solution that others had discovered when I was a small child, but that got lost in the winds as the propaganda took hold and as the denial set in. And I want to talk to you about the only path that we can take. And that is the path to regenerate entire bioregions. And so this is a talk about Cascadia. Cascadia is a name given to a cultural identity and an ecological space, a geographic region. It's a name given to it about 40 years ago. The first uses of the word Cascadia were to describe geology. It's actually a book called Cascadia written by a geologist. It started to have a political use in the mid-1980s. And as others here could speak to more eloquently than I, in 1986, there was the first Cascadia Bioregional Congress at Evergreen State College in Olympia. So I'm talking about a movement with roots and with history. And this is the modern incarnation, without speaking of the indigenous peoples who have been here for much, much longer, and who, as Deborah said, are still here. What I want to talk about is who may be here in 500 years, who may be here in 1,000, if indeed humans are still around. That's what I want to talk to you about tonight. How do we build the bridge to that future? How do we weave the golden thread that carries life through dark times? To begin that story, I want to make a point that many others have made, but it's a point that needs to be repeated, which is that when you look at the Earth from space, you will notice a complete absence of boundaries. You'll notice our nation states and our jurisdictions are complete fiction. They don't exist except in the human mind. The other thing you'll notice is a holistic, dynamic, integrated system. And I want to talk about what happens when you have such an integrated system, because it starts to paint the way, starts to reveal the path for where we must go. Because if you look at this image, and if I were to ask you, where is there water, the astute observer would answer, where is there not water? Because there's water in the ocean, but also on the continents, there's water in the lakes and the rivers. And in the atmosphere, there's water in the clouds. But even where there are no clouds, there's water vapor, even in the most desert, dry environments. And if you go to our subduction zones, which is where the oceanic plates go under the continents, you'll see that water is carried down into the magma and that it bursts forth as steam in our volcanoes. Water is even in the interior of the Earth. Water connects all life in all of these dynamics. But this integration brings with it systemic risk. And that's the place I want to begin, is with the systemic risk. And so I want to share a framework with all of you that some of you may have heard of. And it's hard to read in the back, but I'm going to go through it. Just by a show of hands, who here has heard of the planetary boundaries? Maybe about a quarter, maybe 25%. So planetary boundaries is actually, even those who know about it don't often understand its significance. So I want to explain it because part of my training is in Earth system science. This graphic represents the answer to a very interesting question. In 2009, the Stockholm Resilience Center, which represents about 3,500 scientists who study the dynamic Earth, they asked a very interesting question. They asked, 
with everything we know about the dynamic Earth, are there any thresholds that if we crossed that threshold, we would leave the warm, stable period known as the Holocene, the last 12,000 years, which is the time in which we've had agriculture, permanent settlements, empires, city-states, civilizations, globalized economies. They all existed in the Holocene. And if we cross just one of these boundaries, we would leave that space and the ability to have these complex, distributed societies, this, this possibility could go away. We would leave the safe op operating space for humanity at large scales. So they ask this question, are there any thresholds or boundaries where if even one was crossed, we'd leave this safe space? And then they did the research, they held conferences, they published papers, and they came back and said, there are nine. There are nine. Climate change is only one of them. We talk a lot about climate change these days, but it's only one. Another is called biosphere integrity, which is the measure of the rate of extinction. Because as you cause species to go extinct, you start to unravel ecosystems until they collapse. And if you unravel the Earth's biosphere enough through a mass extinction event, you create an unstoppable cascade. The third is land system change, which is when you take a complex, healthy ecosystem and you degrade it through deforestation or desertification to create agriculture, to create urban environments, all of which are degraded landscapes. So if you change too many land systems, then it unravels the biosphere. Then the fourth is freshwater use, because only 1% of the world's water is freshwater. 99% is salt water. And if that fresh water is contaminated, or if it's unavailable, then your ability to have complex, distributed human societies goes away. Then there's biogeochemical flows, which is for reactive nitrogen and phosphorus used in industrial fertilizers, that when it runs off of our fields and into our rivers, and then down into our oceans, it creates huge dead zones, which threatens to collapse the base of the food, food chain in the world's ocean. Then there's ocean acidification, because if the ocean becomes too acidic, calcium carbonate begins to dissolve. Calcium carbonate is what's in coral, in clams and mollusks, in the hard bodies of all of sea life, which again would cause a collapse of those marine ecosystems. Then there's atmospheric aerosol loading, which is just another way of saying air pollution. If there's too much air pollution. Then you have stratospheric ozone depletion, which is in the stratosphere, there's a layer of ozone that absorbs the ultraviolet radiation. That if that ultraviolet radiation got to the surface, there wouldn't be life on land for any of our continents. And then the last one is novel entities, which is any chemical created by humans that the planet can't deal with. It's so like, okay, there are nine. And remember, if we cross even one, we leave this safe space for humanity. So there's a natural follow-up question, right? How are we doing? How many have we crossed? So they did the research, and in 2015, they found that we had crossed four. We crossed the boundaries for climate change, for the rate of extinction, for land system change, and for reactive nitrogen and phosphorus. And then the research continued, and they got better data, and better at asking the questions, and better methods. And so in 2021, they added two more fresh water use and ocean acidification. We've crossed these. We didn't cross the boundaries in this time. It's just that the research got good enough that they could verify that we had indeed crossed them. And then in 2022, they added novel entities because microplastics. Microplastics are in every drop of breast milk of every woman on Earth. They're in every water supply on Earth. They even find them in clouds above mountains. And so, this is where we are. We've crossed seven of the nine planetary boundaries. Now, if you look at this graphic and you ask yourself, what would I do to address a situation like this? I'll tell you an answer that doesn't make any sense. Change your light bulbs. Buy more green consumer products. Or replace the internal combustion engine in your single occupancy vehicle with an electric battery in your single occupancy vehicle. This isn't going to do it. 
especially since that battery requires you to scrape the sea floor and tear the tops off of mountains to get the lithium. What this graphic represents is the necessity to reimagine the human presence on Earth. Nothing less than reimagining the human presence on Earth can address something this significant. Now, a lot of people who learn about the planetary boundaries also don't understand why are they boundaries. Well, this is a graphic that summarizes the tipping points of the Earth system. Now, I don't need to go through all of them, but I'll give you a couple examples. The Greenland ice sheet. Because of global warming, the Greenland ice sheet is melting. If it melts too much, it'll cause sea level rise. Or if the fresh water goes into the North Atlantic too quickly, it will shut down what's called the thermohaline circulation, the great conveyor belt of the world ocean, and immediately start to create chaos in all of our weather systems. Or the permafrost in Siberia, which is four meters thick frozen vegetation. And as it starts to thaw, microbes get in there and start to decompose it, releasing massive amounts of methane. There are already huge craters exploding methane out of the ground in Siberia. Or what about the West Antarctic ice sheet, where if that ice sheet falls into the ocean, sea level instantly rises by about four or five meters, which would flood about half of the human population, which is very close to the coastlines around the world. Or what if the Amazon rainforest collapses? Or the boreal forest, the world's largest forest, that spans the Arctic Circle? See, these tipping points are what they use to define the planetary boundaries. The planetary boundaries are crossed if you have any changes that lead us across these tipping points. And of course, they're not isolated. One tipping point being crossed can create a cascade, making others more likely. So this is the kind of systemic risk represented by the planetary boundaries. So let's look at an example of this to see how it works. This is the feedback loop for ice in the Arctic Ocean. And it works like this. If there's global warming, which means the atmosphere is warmer, then it melts the sea ice. Well, sea ice, being white, reflects about 90% of sunlight into space. The ocean, being dark blue, absorbs about 90% of sunlight. So if you have less sea ice, less sunlight is reflected into the into the, back into space. The ocean absorbs more heat, which causes the atmosphere to warm more. And this is a positive feedback loop. It's amplifying itself. And so the question is, what happens when there's no more sea ice in the Arctic Ocean? This is one of those tipping points. What's interesting is what happens when you look at the jet stream, because the jet stream tells you where the weather is. See this right here? This pattern looks like a capital omega. That's the pattern that brings you the rain here in Cascadia during the winter. When that pattern sets up, it rains for several months. What do you think will happen when there's no longer ice in the Arctic Ocean during the Northern Hemisphere's summer, which is called the Blue Ocean Event? Is suddenly there's a lot more warming in the Arctic, and there's a cascade of changes, which causes our jet streams to become unstable, and this region loses its characteristic weather, its characteristic climate, this cold period with extended rain. This is the kind of effect that happens when we cross the planetary boundaries. So the Earth is a whole system. Everything is integrated. There are cascading relationships, right? These cascading relationships can break down across space and time. This creates systemic risk. But there's a silver lining in this message, which is look at how much we're learning about the Earth. Look at how much we know about how the Earth works, which means we can start to piece together how these interdependencies create risk, because it's the exact same interdependencies that allow us to build up systemic resilience. But because the breakdown unfolds across space and time, this is something that cannot be addressed in any one place. It must be addressed across multiple places at the same time. It must be addressed across different places around the world at the same time. Which leads us 
to an insight that I gained as I was traveling the world visiting regenerative projects. I visited lots of regenerative projects, and I noticed that all of them were bounded by the limitations of a plot of land. You have a great permaculture project. You have a regenerative farm. You have a reforestation project or a riparian ecosystem restoration. They're always bounded by the plot of land. But of course, the plot of land is embedded within larger ecological connections. For example, you might have this great regenerative farm in a watershed and someone upstream dumps some chemicals in and they drain across your land. These are ecological connections. What's interesting is the ecological connections are already self-organized into holistic landscapes. Things like watersheds, coastal estuaries, precipitation patterns. They have holistic systems at a landscape scale that organize them. And those holistic landscapes are embedded within larger planetary processes, such as the evaporation over the Pacific Ocean that brings rain and drops it here in the Cascades. These planetary processes move across landscapes. Now, when I looked at these four levels and asked myself, where's the pathway to planetary sustainability? I found that it's not in any of them. You can't find it in any of them. But if you shift your perspective ever so slightly, you'll see that you can find it across them. You can find it across them. This is how it works. I go to that regenerative farm or that permaculture project, and I notice that it's already inside of a holistic landscape. And then I start to find all of the regenerative projects. Maybe it's a watershed. I find all of the regenerative projects in that landscape, and I look for the ecological connections between the plots of land. And then I can start to weave a tapestry of regenerative projects through the ecological connections of the landscape and regenerate the entire landscape. And as I do this, I start to see how that landscape affects other landscapes through planetary processes. And with the amount of knowledge we have about the dynamic Earth, we can begin to reconstruct the resilience and the stability of planetary processes. But it must be done across landscapes. This leads us to a really interesting observation that has profound significance. I'm going to say it in sort of a, a simple way, that everything that happens anywhere on Earth happens somewhere. Everything that happens anywhere on Earth happens somewhere. It seems kind of like a simple thing to say, right? Just obviously true. But what's interesting is that because everything happens somewhere and the world is a web of interdependencies, you can start regenerating the connections from anywhere. So the question is, where are you? Where are we? And the answer is right there. There you are. You're right there. You're inside the Earth. Do you know what I mean? Like the atmosphere is part of the Earth. We're inside the atmosphere. We're inside the hydrological cycle. We're inside the carbon cycle as living beings. We're inside the Earth's processes, and we're somewhere. And what I want to express is that place is incredibly powerful. Place is incredibly powerful for creating transformational change. And let's look at how that works. Here we are on Whidbey Island. And you can just see, like, there's so much complexity here. There's so much structure that you don't have to create. It's already there. You can work with all of that structure, all of those relationships that are already there. And when you zoom out, it's like, whoa, there's even more, which is that this place is connected to the whole Salish Sea. It's connected to the, the snowpack in the mountains. It's connected to the fish moving up and down the rivers. It's connected to landscapes, as tapestries. All of those relationships are ecological connections that you could work with to grow to larger scales. It works like this. Every place, every single place, has a unique geologic history like no other place on Earth. Every place has a unique ecological history, 
the kind of life that exists there. It's like no other place on Earth. And every place, if humans have lived there, has a unique cultural history. And so when you start to look at the geologic, ecological, and cultural history of your place, you start to see that there's a story of place that tells you how to live here. What kinds of rocks create what kinds of soils create what kinds of weather patterns here? What kinds of life and what kinds of ecosystems thrive and flourish here? What kinds of human cultures enable people to live sustainably here? And as you start to gather these questions and tell the story of place, you gain whole system understandings of your place. Whole system understandings. And what's amazing about this is the story of place is not static and it's not finished. Because when you arrive into a place, you enter an unfolding story. The story is still happening. So as you reconstruct the history and you gain a holistic understanding, you can start to imagine the regenerative futures, the future life and flourishing, health and well-being of this place. It's all there. All the information you need comes from its history, together with its current context. From its current context, you might notice, well, all of these rivers have had salmon in the past, but now only 10% of them do. What would it mean to regenerate those rivers? One thing might be to restore the salmon. Or you might say, the landscapes have dried out and they don't hold as much water anymore. Maybe we should bring back the beaver you start to see that the history tells you what to do. It tells you how flourishing works in this place. And you are an active participant in the story simply by being alive in the place. So as you awaken to the story, you can start to shape its future. Here's an example of how this works. So this is an image I took from Google Earth. This is Eugene, Oregon. North is that way. And if you look at this image, you can pretty easily tell where the degraded places are. So I've got a daughter who's almost seven years old. She loves to draw. She were to take some crayons. She'd go, oh, there they are. She'd just color them in. Right? You can see it. If I take them away, the degraded areas are in the valleys. They're in the watersheds. And the bottom of those valleys is where they cut down all the forest and put in monoculture, agriculture. And the confluence of the rivers, in this case, the McKenzie River and the Willamette River, is where the urban landscape is. That's a very degraded landscape with regards to ecology. And so you can start to see that you could organize around the naturally occurring patterns of the land. The land actually shows you how to organize it. What's interesting is if you look at this one, it's about 10 miles long, maybe three miles across. This is a human scale of organizing. What would it take to regenerate that valley? Well, you might go and talk to the landowners. There might be a hundred of them. But you could imagine going door to door and visiting with people and starting to form coalitions. You could imagine creating a map, like the way an architect or a landscape planner might do, and say, oh, well, how do you restore a watershed? You start at the top and you work your way down. Where are the natural? ecological connections. Let's restore them if they're broken. Let's expand from them if they're there. This is a human scale of organizing. You could walk from one end to the other in a day. If you take a group in cars, you could drive around and visit different sites and map it and learn it. This is a human scale of organizing. And you can see here three possible collaborative processes to regenerate watersheds. The land shows us what to do. Now, what's interesting about this is when we go to a larger scale, now we have the Willamette Valley. I changed direction. Now this way is north. That's Portland, and that's Eugene. When you look at this, this is about 100 miles from one end to the other. It's about 50 miles east to west. It's much larger. Thoroughly degraded and deforested landscape in western Oregon. And you're like, how would you regenerate something so large? But it's the same thing. Take your crayons, start drawing the most degraded places. They're all the watersheds again. 
So you start to see that if projects like these, these are the three I showed in the graphic before, if those are a scale that humans could organize around, then you can see that regenerating the Willamette River or the Willamette Valley, maybe there are 40 or 50 of these drainages. That's just 40 or 50 different projects that could all happen at the same time, each of them organized locally. And you start to see the pattern of how to regenerate Western Oregon. Now, if you go out even further, here's the Columbia River Basin. Now, this is huge, right? It's so big. 174 rivers drain into the Columbia, 258,000 square miles, about the same size as the drainage of the Colorado River. This thing is huge. But look, there's the Willamette Valley. And you start to see that the same way you would organize parallel projects within the Willamette Valley could be replicated throughout the Columbia Basin, and you could regenerate the entire Columbia Basin. You just repeat the same local pattern and organize it across the way the landscape has already organized itself. What's interesting about this is when we go out to all of the watersheds of Cascadia, see here's the Columbia Basin, up here's the Fraser River, another big one that goes through Vancouver, but you see you could do the same thing, right? This is a powerful way to organize local landscapes. But what's interesting is we can start to imagine a mycelial web of regeneration across Cascadia. How might it look? Let's say there are parallel projects all throughout Vancouver Island, the Fraser River, some areas of the, of the Salish Sea. And then as that starts to work, people start to get inspired. So maybe down here in the Snake River, coming out of Wyoming, they start doing the same thing. And you can see a mycelial pattern of local regenerative projects organized across the nested levels of reality that already exist, which is there are smaller streams that run into bigger rivers and into bigger plains. And those bigger rivers can form much larger hydrological basins or the Salish Sea. But they're already naturally organized across multiple levels of reality. So if we want to regenerate bioregions, we can lean into this natural organizing pattern. But to do so, we need to understand how to organize the humans. <laughs> so we need some structures of bioregional regeneration. How do humans structure their own organizing? Again, we organize ourselves by the land. The land is our teacher. The land will tell us how to organize ourselves. And so if we start going into our landscapes, how do we organize ourselves? One thing we can do is we can create bioregional learning centers, which is the places where we learn that really rich story of place. How do you live here? How did people live here before? Where do you go to learn about this place? Well, go to your bioregional learning center, which is to say, organize all of the ways we learn about this place into a learning ecosystem. But this is going to require that we create territorial governance. We have to be able to set priorities, make decisions, allocate resources. Otherwise, we just feel powerless and depressed as we learn about the story but don't know how to do anything. So we have to create structures of territorial governance. And the, one, the way to do this is to form tapestries of local projects organized by the land and ecosystems of learning organized by the land. So let's look at how this works. To do, well, first, to do this work, we have to design pro-social contexts, which simply means this implies a hell of a lot of cooperation. So you have to be able to create shared identity and purpose. For example, there's a river. Do we want salmon in the river? That's a shared purpose. You have to create shared purpose and build identity and relationship around the shared purpose. You have to have good ways of making equitable distributions of contributions and benefits. Who does the work? Who benefits? How is that structured? Because if it's too unequal, people will not participate. You have to have fair and inclusive decision making. Fast and fair conflict resolution. If there are multiple groups, they have to have collaborative relationships with each other. This is the basis of generosity and trust and cooperation and altruism and abundance. It grows from being pro-social, from learning how to work together. Luckily, a lot is known about how to do that. 
Also, as we've seen in our political systems, a lot is known about to be sure it doesn't happen. They're applying the same knowledge, just toward a different end. Divide and conquer. Who said that? Oh, wait, a lot of people who were dictators. So we have to design pro-social contexts. But before going into the structures of, bio, of bioregional regeneration, I want to just create a shared definition. What is a bioregion? Well, the word bioregion is just short for biological region, re, region right? Or some people would say it's biocultural region. But you know what culture is? Culture is the behavioral expressions of any animals or plants. Yeah, it's social behavior of plants. And so it's a subset of biology, so it's still biological regions. And so a biological region is the geography, the spatial geography, for the entire life system of an organism and its population. That's the bioregion. So all living organisms have a bioregion. For example, starfish. What's the bioregion for starfish? Simple. It's the intertidal zone of the coastline, right? You go to the coastline, and there's high tide, and there's low tide, and there's a place in between where all of the food that those starfish need is there. There's habitat and safe shelter from predators, right? They have a place to reproduce and perpetuate their population. Everything they need, their whole life context, is the intertidal zone. For every organism, you can identify the bioregion. Deer will have bioregions, hummingbirds, oak trees, all of them will have bioregions. Humans have bioregions. But it's more complex for us because there's a cultural dimension to our bioregions that will change depending on our cosmovision or worldview, depending on the kind of technology we have, depending on the kind of political or economic system or the organization of our societies. So human bioregions are a little bit harder to pin down but they're still very real. So the idea is a bioregion is the whole life context for the thriving and the well-being of a population, which means every bioregion, by definition, is a model for the whole system of that organism, for them to survive and be well, which means if you want to regenerate, if you want to create healthy living patterns, for any organism, there's only one scale that will work. It self-organizes to the scale of the bioregion, which means there will be no sustainable human cultures that are not organized as bioregions. It's kind of by definition. The bioregion is the whole life context for the organism to, to survive and thrive as a population, which means the bioregion is the unit or the level of sustainability. So if we as humans want to live into the future as part of this planet, we need to reorganize ourselves as bioregions. We need to create a planetary network of bioregions. And because we have so little time, we need to create learning exchanges between our bioregions to help more places to get there faster. We'll talk in a little bit about why Cascadia is so important in that story as a place with so much to offer to the rest of the world. See, what needs to happen is this. We need to recreate the conditions for living locally in terms of material flows, integrated life systems, meaning how we interact with the rest of life, with the thriving of families and communities. But to do that, we need to recognize that the Earth is not a monoculture. This is a map of ecozones. Each color represents a different kind of ecosystem based on the types of soils, types of climate, and the types of life that can exist there. So every color represents a different ecozone. Now it doesn't matter which one is which by color. What matters is just that there are a whole bunch of them, which tells us that we should expect human cultures that are well adapted to place to be richly diverse. We should expect a diversity of human cultures, a diversity of human economies, because each one is well suited to its place. This leads to a very important essay written by Dana Meadows in 1983. So Dana Meadows, as many of you will know, was the lead author of a very controversial study in 1972 called The Limits to Growth. 
which was a computer simulation of the global economy and the material flows of the economy, where they invented this scenario called business as usual. That phrase actually came from the limits to growth study. And the business as usual uh, scenario was not meant to be a forecast. This is one of the simulations. But unfortunately, it has tracked reality almost perfectly. And the limits to grow, or the, the business as usual scenario shows the human population reaching its peak at 2040. But it begins to slow down starting in 2030, and then it very quickly drops after that. Which is that starting around 2030, the death rate is going to start to rise to follow the, the birth rate in our exponential growth curve. So if that plays out, the next couple of decades are going to be very difficult. And so you can see how that, that, that study in 1972 created a lot of controversy and created a lot of questions. So there was a group that formed at Lake Balaton in Hungary. So they called themselves the Balaton Group. And for about 10 years, they met in different places around the world. And they asked the question, how do we live on a finite planet? How do we reach planetary sustainability? And then in 1983, Dana Meadows wrote this little essay called A Brief History of the Balaton Group, and it was mostly lost until Isabel Carlyle, who lives in Devon in, in England, has started passing the PDF around to people in the last few years. So it's starting to get out again. And this is a quote from that study. So this is an essay from 1983. Vernon Rutten was a member of the Balaton Group, and he said this, each agroeconomic region is so unique that the concept of transfer of technology is irrelevant. What's relevant is the transfer of the capacity to develop technology and institutions that are consistent with the cultural endowment and the ecological or the resource endowment of each region. If we go on, Dana went on to say, out of these 10 years of meetings came a vision of a number of centers where information and models about resources and the environment are housed. There would need to be many of these centers all over the world, each one responsible for a distinct bioregion, which is to say, we need a planetary network of local living economies, and each one of them needs a bioregional learning center. She said this in 1983. I was six years old in 1983. Here we are 40 years later. Has anyone come up with a better way to get to planetary sustainability? No because this is the only way. The only way is to reorganize ourselves as local living economies. And we need to have bioregional learning centers to help us learn how to do this. And we need a network of them all learning together. So this is the 40-year-old you know, gold star winner of the best homework turned in for planetary sustainability. It was shortly after this, in the mid-1980s, starting around 1987, when the first public hearing happened in the US Congress about climate change. They called it global warming back then. And the propaganda machine got going big time. Topics that disappeared from the environmental discourse include human population and patterns of consumption. They just increasingly got pushed to the side. They didn't disappear entirely, but they became enveloped in technocratic solutions, in green consumer product choices, and in rational choice economic paradigms that have been thoroughly debunked by behavioral science. To basically get us to talk about carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere instead of how to be humans as part of the Earth. And so while this work of deeply understanding sustainability has continued, the discourse, the environmental discourse, has become a really bad joke. It's so far removed from the reality of our situation. And what Dana Meadows laid out here in 1983 is still the only game in town. So I want to talk to you about how to do this by using an example in another bioregion. This is the topographic map of Colombia in the northern Andes. Where I live in Barichara, Colombia is right about there. It's in a region that forms a well-defined climate system because there's a tall mountain range over here that blocks the air. It's a cloud forest, and it's in the rain shadow on the other side. There are tall mountains here and tall mountains here. And the only place that the air can come in with moisture is from the south, and it rotates and circulates. 
creating a well-defined climate system that's about 500,000 hectares in size. Inside this zone is a unique ecosystem like no other on Earth, the High Andes Tropical Dry Forest, 80% endemic species. Eight out of 10 species exist nowhere else on Earth, and it's more than 95% deforested, and it's rapidly becoming a desert. This is what Barichara looks like, this town right here. Its tourism slogan is the prettiest town in Colombia, which is probably true. It's really a beautiful place. And this is a picture that I took from Bioparque Moncora, which is a community reforestation project. Started in 2009. Everything in the foreground looked like this, this bare clay and rock in 2009. And now it's growing back into native forest with a lot of interaction with children from the public schools and with people from around the world. And so I want to show you how in Barichara we're creating these structures of bioregional regeneration. When I arrived in November of 2019, I did the permaculture thing, which is you show up and you observe the patterns and you don't intervene, and you learn how the patterns work, and then you start to work with those patterns, like the ethic of care for the patterns you see. So what I saw was a heavily degraded landscape and a lot of really beautiful regenerative projects organized as plots of land. So I started getting to know the projects. And then I started working to bring the leaders of those projects together to help them collaborate with each other. What's interesting is that Colombia has a really difficult history in the last century. It was a 58-year period called La Violencia, the time of violence, when there was extreme violence. It was homegrown terrorism, this multipolar trap of Usually in every place, at least three different kinds of groups all killing each other indiscriminately in the street, which means Colombians have a good reason to kind of keep their heads down and not trust their neighbors, which means it took the white guy from the north showing up to help them learn how to cooperate because they weren't doing it on their own. Reality is full of really interesting surprises. And so when I showed up, I started seeing all these great projects, but they weren't talking to each other. They didn't know about each other. They certainly weren't working together at the scale of their landscape. So I started to mobilize resources and bring them together, help them to collaborate. We started with about 15 of these local projects. But how did we organize it? Well, here are four of the territorial patterns that we used to weave together the projects. The first one is the restoration of entire watersheds. Because in Barichara, all of the rivers are dead. They're dead. There's either no water in them, and when it rains, it just causes massive erosion and runs down into the valley below, or they're so contaminated that nothing can live in them. This is actually common all across Latin America and many other parts of the world. And so we're in a place where we have to restore the life of rivers. So that means we need to restore entire watersheds, creating community water councils, engaging in watershed restoration, soil building, reforestation from the top down into the drainages. So this is a pattern for how to organize ourselves. Another thing that we did is we created a learning center in Centropic Agroforestry. Centropic Agroforestry is a set of techniques developed in Brazil. You could sort of call it like a particular agroforestry permaculture system, if you wanted to think of it that way. And what's beautiful about Centropic Agroforestry is it is the fastest way to create a climax ecosystem because of the way that you select the diversity of species to minimize competition between the species for the filling of niches and the labor-intensive pruning processes that cycle biomass and build soils. So when we started doing centropic agroforestry, we started creating a paradigm for a different kind of economy because this is a forest system that allows you to grow food, medicinal plants, textiles and natural fibers, and construction materials the basis of a local material economy. And of course, once the forest comes back, the animals come back, and then you can start doing hunting and other things like the indigenous people did before. So you need to build these agroforestry systems. The way we did this as a pattern was we invited a centropic teacher, we hosted workshops, and we set up two community demonstration sites, where with a workshop, we would create a community demonstration, and then the participants of the workshops many of whom had their own land, would come and practice in the demonstration sites, but also 
we would do technical site visits to their land, creating a pattern of relationships across 30 different private pieces of land and two demonstration sites, driven by the interest of those who wanted to learn these methods. This leads us to the transformation of local food systems. In Barichara, we're really lucky because we get about 70% of our food within 10 kilometers of the town. That's pretty crazy because usually it's less than 3% to have a food shed that is nearly sustained within walking distance of the town. Now it's a town of 6,000 people in the countryside. There may be 3,000 or 4,000 more. So it's pretty small populations. But just imagine, 10 kilometers is six miles. Within six miles, you could carry your harvest to town on your back or on the back of a mule, and you could actually have a real transport system, even without petroleum. So we need to transform the food system. And because there's so much deforestation, there's huge opportunity to grow our food production with reforestation techniques. And then the fourth way is in the design of alternative economic models, where we build solidarity exchanges and exchanges built on trust. We created a community market. There are about 80 local producers, not just food producers, but textiles, cosmetics, people who make food, meaning processed products all of them made from local resources and local plants. And we're creating different kinds of economic models, time banking, community currencies, all kinds of interesting things. And just with these four patterns, there are actually more patterns than these, but just with these four, you can start to see how to weave together the local projects around your landscape. There's a logic to it. Now what's interesting about this is that this kind of work requires us to completely imagine education in a different way. We have to reimagine education because there is no regenerative action that doesn't involve education. It's all education. All of it is education. And so we do really interesting things in Barichara. Like for example, we have all these dead streams and dead rivers. So Felipe, who's sitting here at the goatee, decided that he would start an activity called Caminatas del Agua, Walking the water, the water walks. He took children between the ages of four years old and 10 years old, got permission from the landowners, and walked through the drainages of the dead rivers. And then the children would ask the adults, what happened to the water? And this would break open the hearts of the adults and replant a sense of conscience. And the adults would start to say things like, well, when I was young, we were killing our neighbors, we were hiding, we were afraid of each other. And when we started to fight with our neighbors, the water went away. This is a saying they have in the Andes, that when the neighbors start to fight, the water leaves. And when the neighbors come back together, the water returns. Which is also, for those of you who have done watershed restoration, this is how you do it. You collaborate across the fence line to restore the flow of water, regardless of where your boundaries are. And so they started doing these water walks to restore the rivers. And these children started coming up with ideas because adults who are experts in different aspects would come and start to advise them. And indigenous leaders like this Muisca man, Muisca is the culture based in Bogota, will come and give the children inspiration and guidance and support. And the children are the ones who are restoring the river. This little girl on the left, her name is Quetzal. In this picture, she's six years old. And she's presenting their ideas for restoring the Barichara River. My favorite one of the ideas written on that piece of paper is when she said, what if we took like some grass and we bound it all together, and we put some mushrooms in it, and then we put those mushrooms in the water and they can take the contaminants out of the water? Because this six-year-old girl watches YouTube videos with her dad. <laughs> and so the important thing about this is this only works if the adults take the children seriously. What these children, these, these children are regenerative leaders in our community, but they'll stop real quick if the adults aren't listening. So this is one of the things that we take very seriously is how to help the children lead. Another thing that we do, as depicted in this other image, this is Gabriella and her granddaughter Soraya. Another thing that we do is whenever possible, when we're talking about an important matter, we have the children play in the middle of the circle. Because we want the children to remember what the grown-ups were talking about when they were kids. And we want the adults to
to have a direct feedback about the integrity they have to hold for who they're making these decisions for. So we bring the children into the process in a deeply integrated way. It has transformative effects. So you see that in many cases, the teachers are a surprise. The teachers are the land. The teachers are the water. The teachers are the birds. And the teachers are the children. Because the children have not had their conscience broken yet. And so these are some of the ways we're regenerating culture and conscience to be able to regenerate landscapes in Bodhichara. Now what's interesting is, when you look at some of these projects from a, from a map, see here's that Bio Parque Moncora, that community reforestation project. Right next to it is Fundacion Monte Chico. There's a little trail here. You can walk in five minutes from one to the other. Fundacion Monte Chico is a place where they bring together teachers and they teach middle schoolers bioconstruction and how to process native plants to make textiles and natural fibers. What's interesting is these two projects, so close to each other, when I arrived, they didn't know about each other and they weren't working together. So where they are on the map is not where they are in relationship to each other. And so if you look at a collection of projects. This is some of the projects in Barichara. I know you can't read them. It doesn't really matter. What matters is they're different. Here's Cane Colibri, which is a community theater where the children learn indigenous mythic stories to help them connect to land and become good land stewards. This one is Corasoma, which is where a group of healers gather women in, in talking circles to help heal the cycles of, of trauma and violence in their homes. Here's Agua Santa, a community regener or a regenerative agroforestry project that's doing watershed restoration. See, they're different from each other. And when I put them on a slide like this, you can't really tell how should they work together. What should you prioritize? Which project should work with other projects? But when you put them on a map, you start to see, oh, Cane Colibri, that theater, is over here. Down here is Agua Santa, a regenerative farm. They're in the same drainage. If we want to restore the watershed in that drainage, then we connect the community theater and the education that's happening there with the children in the community and weave it with the regenerative agriculture practices in the drainage below. And the land tells us which projects should work together. The land tells us how to organize our efforts. You can imagine a curriculum about how to regenerate this watershed that would make use of the field sites for research and practice within the watershed, and you're creating a different kind of school. And so, I want to just talk briefly about what is a bioregional learning center to give you a better sense of it. A bioregional learning center does a couple of things that are different from other schools. One is, it focuses on the coordination of learning processes, which means they may not even create any new education programs. Or maybe they do. But their primary focus is to coordinate between the learning processes, to help go and figure out what's in the community and bring it together, which means they do a lot of mapping and knowledge sharing. They're figuring out what's there and figuring out how it can work together, creating a form that it can be shared more easily, and then sharing it across their community. They're also the gateway into community activities. Which means if you show up in the community and you say, I'm really interested in trauma healing. Oh, then you should talk to this group. I really love trees and I'm interested in trees. Oh, you should talk to that group. So the Bioregional Learning Center becomes a wayfinding tool, a navigation system. And this isn't just for outsiders who visit. Let's say you live in the community and you want to get involved in regeneration. You could go to your Bioregional Learning Center and navigate your way to what you care most about or what you most want to learn. This is also a place for advanced modeling and simulation, like you'd find at universities or research labs. Why? Because we need all of the knowledge that we can get about our place. Here we are in the Salish Sea. What are the movement patterns of fish? How does it relate to the tidal forces that move the water and the mixing processes in the ocean? How do they relate to the subduction zones and earthquake risk for the big earthquake that's coming? 
See, a bioregional learning center will collaborate with these advanced research capabilities to help build more complete and holistic understandings of place. This means we reimagine universities, we reimagine research. And bioregional learning centers can bring together indigenous perspectives and support the decolonization of our minds. Notice that these two can go together. Because indigenous stories about how to relate to each other through plants, for example, what can I learn from the thimbleberry about how to be a good person? We actually met with an amazing Yakima woman down in Olympia who taught us that a few days ago. Science doesn't tell us that. But really smart indigenous people will be very quick to tell you, we need that science too. We actually need both. We need to bring them together. And so this indigenous perspectives and decolonization alongside science, scientific research, we need both. And notice that a bioregional learning center is both centralized and decentralized. It has centralized parts to create coordination and inventories and databases for knowledge sharing to enable really smart, autonomous, decentralized action. So it's got to be both. So these are some of the elements of a bioregional learning center. Now when we look at territorial governance, how does it work? Well, if you start to map and weave local projects, you're already doing governance. Because how do you map those projects? You gather the people who know about the projects and you start talking to them. And you get them talking to each other. And as they do that, they will begin to identify shared needs and priorities. They're already beginning a process of governance by identifying the needs and priorities. And as they do this, they can start to form landscape partnerships, multi-stakeholder groups who work together to achieve common purposes. So you could imagine there being like a river that you want to restore the salmon. You're going to have to do economic development. You're going to need to work with landowners. You might change the model of land ownership. So you might bring in legal help. You might bring in people that can create land trusts and co-housing and other interesting different models. And you start to see you have to form partnerships because this work is too complex to do on its own. But forming partnerships, alliance building, and alignment is governance. And then you very quickly learn that you need your own community funding structures. Because if you have local groups with local projects and all the knowledge is local, then you need to mobilize resources within the community and allocate them to the projects and then monitor your progress in a way that all of the participants feel is fair and inclusive. And you start to see that community funding structures are essential. They're just essential. They must be there. And by the way, funding here represents any kind of value exchange, not just money. You might have, for example, we were just learning in Seattle a few days ago about EarthCore, which is a way for high schoolers to get connected to volunteer projects and they need to do community service in high school. So these community fund funding structures can do matchmaking for time, for labor, for knowledge, for tool sharing, for all kinds of things. So these community funding structures emerge when you start to bring the projects together. They start to discover their own assets collectively within their communities. This allows you to mobilize resources and service to the whole system. How would you regenerate an entire watershed? Well, you'd gather the people who are expert in the parts, and you would help them create a holistic understanding together. And then as you do that, they become a collective intelligence. They can allocate resources to the whole, which is the opposite of what usually happens, which is competition to the common denominator, which is what we see when we don't have these participatory governance and funding structures. And notice that this is the pathway to sovereignty. Sovereignty isn't just like a natural right, like you have it. Sovereignty is created as capacities together. As you map the projects and bring people together into shared leadership, and through their shared leadership, they partner and mobilize resources for common goals, they are more sovereign. Sovereignty grows as capacities of governance. And as that happens, you strengthen collaboration internally, which means you have stronger negotiations with external partners. 
all of which is related to governance. And so the process of bioregional learning and the process of collaboration around landscapes creates territorial governance. So this leads me to uh, something I want to share that can help us visualize this a little differently. Because oftentimes when we talk about environmental issues and regenerative projects, we don't talk about how do you fund them at scale? How do you mobilize the resources you need? So this is a diagram that explains a funding model developed by the Common Land Foundation, based in the Netherlands. And Common Land Foundation works on landscapes of 100,000 hectares or larger for 20 years or longer. And the founder of Common Land Foundation, his name's Willem Verwerda, he's a tropical ecologist. At one time, he was the director of IE IUCN, which is the Global Organization for Biodiversity. And he got to observe in that role these amazing projects. And as soon as the funding ran out, you could cue the chainsaws because someone had come and buy up the land. And he started to see that we don't need any more project funding. We need funding for processes that don't end. And he started asking, how would we regenerate an entire landscape, a watershed? And he started talking to some of his wealthy friends, because he's from the Netherlands. He has wealthy friends, really smart people in business. But in terms of ecology, they were kind of ecological idiots. They just didn't know. He'd talk about ecology like, whew, they didn't get it. So he started having to simplify the story and find language that they would understand. So he asked himself, are there any ways that people with money fund projects that are really large, really complex, that can cost hundreds of millions of dollars or billions of dollars and that last for decades? The answer is yes. Infrastructure projects. Just think of an infrastructure project, like the light rail system in Seattle. It's a $58 billion project that's designed to last for decades, which means when you go to investors or philanthropists and you want them to put large amounts of money in, you need to give them language they can understand. So he created this model to talk to those people. What he found was, when you talk about an infrastructure project, you're talking decades, 20 years or longer. You're also talking about really complex project management, which is one of the most important things for an infrastructure project, is that you fund a really good management team. And so he started talking about a core team for landscape processes. And he said, oh, you have to fund that core team from the very beginning he said, ah, and in practice, what we're finding is you need about $2 million a year to fund your core team. So just do the math. 20 years, $2 million per year, $40 million for your core team. This is a reasonable price for a project management team that's going to build a regenerative economy in your landscape. So like, oh, so I can use this as a way of helping people with more money to see how they could put it in. But wait, you don't just fund the core team. You also have to build the regenerative projects. Because these regenerative projects become public goods infrastructure. Public goods. Public goods in the sense that we all invest in them because everyone benefits and because we need them to do the most basic things. For example, kind of hard to have a knowledge economy without people with, who have an education. So education is a public good. Now we've privatized it with neoliberal universities and all that, but that's actually destroying the public good of education. So we have to go the other way. And so what they found is, in practice, you need 4 or $5 million a year to fund all of the regenerative projects. And the core team is helping to integrate them through holistic landscape management. So you do the math again. $5 million a year, 20 years, you need $100 million to build the public goods infrastructure. But here's what's interesting. Let's say you want to create a regenerative business. What they found in practice is it takes eight to 10 years before the infrastructure of your regenerative economy is well enough developed that regenerative businesses are profitable. Try and create a regenerative business, you have to create this thing called the valley of death, which is the place where it has to survive without funding for a really long time. All of you entrepreneurs out there know what I'm talking about, where you try and get things going, but you, you can't keep them going long enough for them to take off. And so they found it takes eight to 10 years before you have profitable businesses in the regenerative economy, which is when you have a tax base from that income, which is when local governments start to understand this model. Right? 
and then your regenerative economy starts to take off, and you can have members of your local government reinvesting in the tax base, and you start to have a different kind of economic system. So what they found, they've now done this. They're doing this work in 25 landscapes. They started in 2012. About half of them are in the last five years, so there are only a few of them that have more than a decade of data. But this is a model that works and that investors are starting to understand, and larger amounts of money are moving into holistic landscape regeneration to create regenerative economies. Because the, the smaller scale doesn't work. You have to do it at the holistic scale. There are other details I could talk about. I just wanted you to see that there's actually a way of saying, well, what if we wanted to um, look for $250 million to create a regenerative economy at the scale of our watershed? Thank you, Common Land. They figured it out. And so what's interesting about this is that we have to think and act at this scale, which leads to the idea of the bioregional investment platform, a phrase developed by my friend Stuart Cowan, who I think some of you know. And it works basically like this. If you are weaving a tapestry of projects organized in a landscape, you can think of those projects as being like a portfolio. You have a diverse set of projects. Let's say you have 20 projects. As someone funds them, it actually manages the risk. Because if one of those projects fails, the processes underlying them continue, and most of the projects succeed. So this becomes a risk management tool. Super important if you're going to try and mobilize the huge amounts of money like what's in pension funds or the trillions of dollars in the carbon markets that can't go anywhere because they actually have a legal obligation to protect the money as wealth managers. The people making the decisions are not the owners of the wealth. And so you can't even move the money at large scales without reducing the risk. By organizing in this way, you start to create a diverse portfolio of projects and a single holistic intervention, which is a regenerative economy at the scale of a landscape. This is actually easier to fund than your individual project. And so the idea is that your territorial governance and your bioregional learning with your portfolio of projects can all become a bioregional investment platform. And so bioregional learning centers, which is your ecosystem of learning, territorial governance, which comes through that collaborative funding and governance of projects, an integrated landscape management framework at the scale of your landscape, and a robust circulation of value between them. Or said in other language, you weave the people in projects. This grows their ability to cooperate with each other. This deepens their ability to organize. And you birth a regenerative economy, which by definition is a bioregion, because it's a holistic system. And so here's the Salish Sea. Look at all those watersheds. Imagine a bioregional learning center here in the Kinsem, or over here in the Nooksack, or down here in the Snohomish. Imagine bioregional investment platforms for each of these watersheds. What would you do? You would go in and start to learn about the projects that are there. You'd convene them and facilitate them, collaborating with each other. You'd mobilize resources to support them to collaborate. You would form a coordination team and fund it. And then you would build your bioregional investment platform for the watershed. This is how you would do it. And if you did this in every watershed, you could regenerate the Salish Sea. What's interesting about this map to me is where you look. If you just look at where the watersheds are and compare it to the indigenous language families. Isn't that interesting? I'll go back. They're not the same, but they're similar. What is a language family? A language family is a meshwork of extended periods of trade. Right? You develop a shared language as you exchange with people. So you could think of these language families as being like the remnants of bioregional exchange networks, which are organized roughly as the watersheds, but not exactly, because they did exchange across watersheds. And you start to see that human bioregions are not the watersheds, but they're also not that different from them, because they are constrained by the material flows of the landscapes themselves. So you also can see that this right here is a map of existing regenerative economies, or at least knowledge about how to build them, 
from people who are mostly still here, which says that there is a huge role for First Nations people to build their sovereignty, to collaborate with the settler culture people who want to regenerate landscapes. And a way to do that is through bioregional learning, through territorial governance, through collaborative funding and decision making, organized around watersheds. This leads us to our Regenerate Cascadia tour that you are now a part of by being here tonight. This crazy track, what are we doing here? What's the logic? You can maybe start to see the logic. Beginning of the month, we started in the Columbia River Gorge at a place called Salilo Falls, which is the oldest place of continuous exchange that we have evidence for. 15,000 years of economic exchange. Oldest place that we know of in all of the Americas. We started in the Columbia River Gorge. Then we went to Eugene. By the way, we're having the same conversation we're having right here, right now. Then after Eugene, we went to Portland. Then after Portland, we went to Olympia. Then we jumped over, went to went to Vashon Island, then we went to Seattle. Here we are in Whidbey. After Whidbey, we're going to jump across the ferry to Port Townsend. Then we're going to go to Victoria. Then we're going to go to Ga Gabriola. There are actually plans emerging right in this time that aren't on the map to go and visit some of the wisdom holders in Ferry Creek on Vancouver Island. Then we're going to go to Bell Bellingham, then Skagit Valley, and then back to Seattle. And in 30 days, we're going to activate a mycelial network of regeneration for Cascadia. What's interesting about this is that we're actually doing something bigger. Because in January, my partner Penny, who's back in the back, she and I, did a bioregional activation tour in the Great Lakes. We started in southern Ontario, in the greater Takaranto bioregion around Toronto, then we went to the Finger Lakes and Genesee River of upstate New York. And then we went to the Cuyahoga River in northeastern Ohio. We didn't cover all the Great Lakes, but we started a pattern of conversations in a cluster of places, and it is spreading across the Great Lakes now. And the people organizing there are planning a summit in February around the regeneration of the Great Lakes. And then in late May and early June, we made a trip of the, from the headwaters of the Colorado River and the western slopes of the Colorado Rockies all the way to the Sea of Cortez in Mexicali, Mexico. And we went up the Gila River, which drains into the Colorado, in southern Arizona. And we planted the seed of how to regenerate the Colorado River. And that led to a landscape leaders retreat about a month ago in Paonia, which is a place where there's a lot of biodynamic farming and watershed restoration in Colorado. The Colorado River is organizing itself. And then here we are in Cascadia. You see the pattern that's beginning to form? Because conversations are emerging now for the biggest drainage, the Mississippi. There's the Buffalo Nation Trust, the Ogallala Aquifer in the Great Plains. There's the Driftless Region in places like Wisconsin and Minnesota. This is how you regenerate a continent. You regenerate a continent by getting bioregions to organize themselves as nested levels of cooperation. And right now, people in the Colorado Basin and in the Great Lakes are learning with us as we travel through Cascadia. Some of them are live streaming right now to be able to follow along with our conversations to speed up this process. So we can create bioregional networks on every continent. And that's how we regenerate the Earth. See, so there's a logic to this. It just makes sense. The thing that was missing was the ability to organize ourselves in space and time with enough knowledge about the Earth and enough breakdown of the dying system. It's almost too late. And we may still go extinct. But if we're going to make it, it's going to be by doing this. So that leads to the Design School for Regenerating Earth. Back in March of this year, we started. So, you know, this is all pretty new. But here's the idea. is People all over the world are gathering to regenerate the Earth at the bioregional scale. 
They're org we're organizing into a planetary network of learning exchanges where we are actually organizing to regenerate landscapes. This is a design school to regenerate landscapes where the classroom is the landscape. Even though we have an online platform to coordinate our learning, most of our learning is happening in spaces like this one right here, right now. You all are part of the design school right now simply by being in this conversation. Of course, I've got a book that you can get a copy of in the back called The Design Pathway for Regenerating Earth. But the beautiful thing is, even if you don't read this book, you are already in its pages because we are living out the design pathway right now with you. We're living it out. It is happening. And that leads us to Regenerate Cascadia. And I wanted to invite the two organizers of Regenerate Cascadia, Brandon and Claire, to come and tell you a little bit more about it. So this is Claire Atwell and Brandon Letzinger. I'd like to invite them up. Welcome. starts here in this room with all of you. So I just kind of wanted to highlight that before moving on. Yeah, so um, Brandon and I met uh, in March, May, um, during the Edge Prime, and we realized that all of the things that Joe has been describing, how do we do that here, as Brandon was saying. And, um, uh, knowing how to, or starting to bring together people that, as Joe was talking about, um, we, we have been working in our communities, we're often so busy um, in our own, the work that we're doing, that we often don't know about each other, and so helping to bring each other together using a digital platform is uh, going to be essential. And, um, and a lot of the work, I, I work as a community artist, and a lot of the work I would do is people's, people would start to see the potential of what was possible, and then there was almost nothing to hold the next step, stages of the relationship. So that's what Brandon and I realized, that potential was the next step, was to start using digital platforms to help um, people see each other, so we start to see who else is not in the room, um, and, uh, yeah. Yeah, and I guess for those of you not familiar with my work, uh, my name is Brandon Lentzinger, and I'm a uh, founding director of an organization called uh, Cascadia Now in 2005, uh, and then stepped back from that in 2016 and 17, and then more recently uh, with the Department of Bioregion and Cascadia Department of Bioregion uh, in 2019. And as Claire was just saying, um, it's been an amazing process to be able to connect. Um, I mean, we connected in April of this year, and we had never met each other before, and we were both doing separate projects as part of the Salmon Nation and Terran Collective Edge Prize, and uh, we 
Claire actually kind of started this process by inviting um, Joe to come and do a tour in Victoria, and we just thought it was too good of an opportunity to pass up, and we said, why just Victoria? Let's like stretch this process out, and let's really ask ourselves the question, what would it take to regenerate an entire bioregion? What would it take to regenerate Whidbey and the Cascadia bioregion? And since then, it's just been a really amazing process. And this started with four people like five months ago. So to see all of this energy coming together so quickly, um, you know, I think is just really like, um, it just shows that it's time. And I think that there's energy and a desire for uh, real meaningful change. So our question with Regenerate Cascadia then is how do we grow Cascadia as part of this planetary network? And with Regenerate Cascadia, there's really three components. The first is how do we grow a regional vision? And that's a vision that extends from every watershed in every one of these 14 places that we're visiting, and it grows up. And then two is how do we create an informational commons? And that informational commons includes education, it includes a story of place, it includes bioregional frameworks, which can actually measure inputs, outputs, and success. And then third, how do we create and administer a bioregional regeneration fund at the scale of a watershed, an ecoregion, and a bioregion that can actually be governed and run by the frontline communities themselves? So these are some of the questions that we wanted to ask ourselves and that we've challenged ourselves with. Yeah, and I guess that's, you know, questions for you. Um, you know, how, where are the gaps? Where is the potential? And um, that's the work that you all need to be doing. Um, and we would really like to be there to help support do that. And, um, and part of that process is as you come together in those conversations, um, that then gives us the ability to start putting together what is the kind of funding that's going to be needed and so that we can actually start to put those, those funds together, those budgets together, and the ability to start naming, that's what we need. And one of the most important processes of this work is going to be building a map of regenerative projects. How can we weave a tapestry of all the regenerative projects together if we don't even know who they are and where they are? <laughs> and the best part of this is that this conversation starts with the people in this room, but it doesn't stop there. So this is just the beginning. And when we start to gather together all of our voices in a watershed, we can also look around and start to identify what voices are missing, what voices need to be a part of this conversation. And I think only after we invite those voices in can we really start to have this discussion. And what's really exciting about that is that when we start to have this discussion, whether it's allocating funding no matter the amount, whether it's making decisions or coming together to talk about a vision, then we've actually started the process of governance. One of our main focuses with Regenerate Cascadia is just simply how do we grow a core team, not only on a bioregional level, but also for each watershed. So that's really going to be our challenge. Um, and lastly, if you're interested in getting involved, there's a few different ways. Um, Deborah, who uh, is down here, would you like to raise your hand? <laughs> okay. if, if you don't, or if you do. Um, Let's also maybe just also extend a huge thank you of uh, putting all of this together, helping arrange the events and the <laughs> And so part of this also will be... Um, Here, that's it, that's yeah. it, right there. <laughs> so Deborah has put together uh, a website, Regenerate Whidbey, uh, regeneratewhidbey.com. Dot com, dot org. Org. Dot org. Um, and anybody who would like to, you're welcome to scan the QR code, and this will take you to the sign-up sheet. You're also welcome to, there's a sheet being passed around uh, with, where you can add emails and organizations, and you're welcome to sign up to that as well. And then these emails will be shared, and then um, I, I believe you'll be following up with people. And the goal, the next step will be for Whidbey to organize itself, and through an in-person gathering, and however you'd like to see that happen. So after I'm done talking, this will also be the last slide, and we'll transition it over. But you can also um, uh, just scan that at any point. We also have some little papers down there that you can pick up that have the code and the link. Yeah. 
So. Um, and this will just be, and this will be shared um, between, you know, so any, if you sign up uh, on the sheet, it will be shared with the local group and vice versa too. So don't worry about information getting lost. And what I was going to say is, um, uh, I can't not put this in is as a community artist uh, often I, actually you know I don't think that you would underestimate the role of the arts because I've looked around and I came to the community and it's filling out all over the place but um, community uh, using the arts to help start a conversation is a really amazing way to um, to just catalyze that conversation and I just wanted to I can't not bring that in because uh, there is the next step of being able to hold that conversation that we're trying to develop. So, yeah. There is the online summit happening, the whole summit, right? Yes. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, so in terms of next steps, um, there will be uh, there will be follow up here as a local group, but one of the big parts of this entire tour is that um, we are only in each community for a very short window in time. And one of the big goals of this project is actually for us to remove ourselves as bottlenecks and just help projects visualize themselves to each other. And so to do that, uh, to jump back for a moment, uh, we will be doing an online bioregional summit uh, November 3rd through 12th. And while that sounds intimidating, it's really just meant to be a capstone of this entire process. Um, so it will be, so the first weekend um, will be presentations and discussions and workshops um, as given by all of the member, amazing members of this region and uh, from the tour and participants. And um, if you're in this audience's, audience, odds are that you're probably an amazing person doing amazing work. And we just want to invite you to come and present. And you're all welcome. Um, during the week, uh, for the weekdays, in the evening time, we will have themed conversations that we hope will turn into broader work groups. So that'll be things like bioregional art, or sorry, community art, bioregional education, regenerative finance, digital platforms and tools, where we can bring people together who are experts in working in these projects with people who might want to use these, pro um, these tools or learn more, and so that they can start to have those conversations. And then the last weekend will be generative. And we want that to be focused on the watershed teams and participants just coming together to meet each other. And then where we can start to talk about visions for what we want the next three months, six months to look like, um, and how we might like to, to work together. Um, so if you're interested, you can go to regeneratecascadia.org. All of this is an amazing process under construction, so just be flexible with us. Um, you go back to the QR code, though, and you yes. just take a picture of that, and that'll give you access to the contact form, and, and a communication will be sent about it. Yes. So, yeah. Yes. Just take a picture of that. And if you discover any issues, do feel free to reach out. The best way to contact us and let us know about those things, or if you want to volunteer to help us, uh, um, is, to, uh, is to jump onto the Telegram group. Uh, it's very responsive, and uh, just let us know, and uh, we're excited to talk to you more. Um, if you like what we do, do think about donating. Um, you know, all of this is just kind of a passion uh, of, of love. None of us are paid to be here. And you can do that by also uh, buying Joe, Joe's book. And uh, pays he might, for gas. it pays for gas and food, and he might even be around to sign it. He might put something nice in there. <laughs> uh, you can also donate to the website and all the rest of that jazz. And then uh, I, I really love that uh, Vicki opened up by, uh, by an, an introduction to uh, Lansing Scott. Um, I think, you know, so I first heard about Cascadia in 2005. But it's been a personal journey of, of learning and growth. And Lansing was with us last night. Yeah. So, so part of this learning and growth has been an exploration and a deepening of how much knowledge and wisdom um, is in this community here and throughout the Cascadia bioregion. And that's become um, present as we've traveled around and met with just amazing people who have been involved for decades. Um, and for me personally, I got involved with Cascadia in 2005, but I didn't hear about bioregionalism until 2009. So that's kind of weird, right? Like, how can you have those two things? But as I did, it deepened. And then in 2014, uh, we had our first Rain Man um, festival, 
And some random person named Peter Moulton showed up and dropped me off one of these Cascadia Bioregional Congress uh, proceedings. And it blew me away. I was like, wait, what? You know, like, I've been doing this for nine years, and I had no awareness that this existed. Because this was pre-internet, um, and this was 150 people gathering at really what started and birthed the Cascadia movement. And they met for a full weekend um, in what became the first Cascadia Bioregional Congress. They would have them every year. They met de delegatively um, as representatives of their watersheds or an animal. And Lansing Scott actually wrote the introduction called Welcome Home um, in this first document. And it just so happens, he also lives like six blocks away from me in Seattle. Because, like I said, there's so much wisdom in our communities, apparently. And I had no idea. So we started getting together, and then we put together this thing. We're like, oh, man, we've got to really do that. And so then we put together this like, thing called the Cascade of Spoke. And so he's actually our co-editor of that. So, and we were lucky enough to be with him in Seattle yesterday. And we did a really nice uh, two-hour-long interview with him. So I, I guess that's all a long ramble to say that 40 years ago, People envisioned, um, challenged themselves to think, what would it look like if we stepped up and took responsibility for our homes, our communities, and our watersheds? And after 40 years later, we just want to challenge you with the same exact question. <laughs> what would it look like if we stepped up and took care of our homes, our watersheds, our bioregions, and what would it take to regenerate Whidbey and the Cascadia Bioregion? So, thank you. Thank you. We have the space until 9.30, so if you need to leave, you can leave. If you want to stay and just hang out and talk and have conversation, we have tea and, and some cookies in the kitchen here, and just help us move the chairs back if you can. Um, are, if there are people who want to be active in looking at what happens on Whitby, we need to know. That's not something I even know how to begin doing. I'm not like that. So, if anyone wants to talk tonight and come up and say, yeah, I'm interested in this exploration, please let us know so we can at least begin to get a local grounding group together, okay? So, raise your hand if you were even considering that. Anyone considering that? Good. So, you know, so everyone is considering it coming out with everyone's everyone's considering it. conversation right over here. But come on over here and we'll please collect your contacts and hang out a little bit, all right? Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.